In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Amen. Let us pray, O God, by the light of the Holy Ghost, as instructed the hearts of thy faithful, and grant us by the same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In my sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, Saint Peter, Saint John and James, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <coughs> come now to the first meditation on the victorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. <clears throat> this is a foundation, one of the great foundations of the Catholic faith. You can go to uh, Germany and find the tomb of Luther. He's all bones and ashes. You can uh, find the tomb of Muhammad, of the Muslims. He's bones and ashes and worms. And John Calvin, and John Smith of the Methodists, and Joseph Smith of the Mormons. All these founders of false religions have been buried in food for worms. And their souls have gone to their judgment. But only one, we don't have his bones, we don't have his relics. And there's only two people, maybe three, we know. One rose by his own power, Christ the King. The others were assumed. That is, the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Francis de Sale held very strongly that St. Joseph also was assumed into heaven. That has yet to be defined by the Church. It seems to have always been believed. And uh, there are no relics of St. Joseph either. So, <clears throat> but St. Joseph and our Lady would be assumed, carried up by angels, but Christ by his own power. Now, what about the Blessed Virgin Mary? Again, again, and again, and again, the, to go to understand Christ, go to the heart of the Blessed Mother. Here's what the Jeremiah the prophet said of the Blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> Weeping she hath wept in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. There is none to comfort her among all them that were dear to her. All her friends have despised her and are become her enemies. Therefore do I weep and my eyes run down with tears, because to comfort her the relief of my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy has prevailed. Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled 
My heart is turned within me, for I am full of bitterness. Abroad the sword of destroys, and at home there is death alike. To what shall I compare thee, or to what shall I liken thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? To what shall I equal thee, that I may comfort thee, O virgin daughter of Sion? For great as the sea is thy destruction, who shall heal thee? All they that passed by the way have clapped their hands at thee. This is the mockery at the foot of the cross. They have hissed and wagged their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city of perfect beauty, the joy of all the earth? Mocking Christ. All the enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They have hissed and gnashed with the teeth. And they have said, We will swallow her up. <clears throat> Lo, this is the day which we looked for. We have found it. We have seen it. So the Blessed Virgin Mary, think about it, when Christ was pierced through on the cross, he was already dead. His heart was opened by the lance of St. Longinus, and tradition says Longinus was partly blind in one eye, and when the blood and water gushed out, some sprinkled on his eye, he was able to miraculously see. And when our Lord was pierced through the heart, who felt it? Who felt it, really? It was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she continued to suffer the passion. And when she held the body of our Lord at the foot of the cross, all mangled, butchered, filled with pus, spit, sweat, blood, his eyes all filled with blood, his beard, whatever was left of it, all ratted with flies and, and uh, clotted blood and uh, the, the pus and serum that formed on the skin. Plus, as the Shroud of Turin shows, the body of our Lord exuded immense amounts of uric acid. And uric acid is purified through the kidneys. And so we know from the shroud that our Lord was so violently kicked like an animal. And so violently scourged that his kidneys gave out. They stopped working. So all the time on the cross, that burning acid on his on his all burning through his all his skin and that that uric acid made possible the impression of the shroud of Turin to be so clear and we have the whole body of our Lord as has been venerated ever since for centuries St. John Bosco would bring the boys to pray at the relic of the shroud St. Francis de Sale would go and pray there also in St. Mass and so many saints to adore the cloth that wrapped our Lord's body. Now, the Virgin Mary, she continued to suffer. So that's Good Friday, Good Friday night. She didn't want to leave the tomb. She, was, she would rather have stayed with our Lord because what's to go to? She was holding our work, our trophy, the day aside of, of the killing of God by our hands. Yes, the Romans ministerially crucified him. It was certainly God's will that he be crucified for our sins. The Father's will firstly. The Jews are guilty of day aside because they are the ones that cried for his crucifixion. Demanded his crucifixion by their tongues. And that's why you get a discrepancy in the scripture. St. Mark says Christ was crucified at the ninth hour. Ra rather, excuse me, at the third hour. And uh, the rest of the evangelists say he was crucified at the sixth hour. 
So which one was right? The sixth hour is 12 noon. The third hour is 9 o'clock in the morning. And both are right, says St. Augustine. Both are right. Why? Because the 12 noon crucifixion, the sixth hour, he was physically crucified. At the third hour, he was crucified by the tongues of the Jews. That's what St. Augustine says. By their tongues, when they shouted, let him be crucified, and like ravening wolves shouted this, like a huge stadium cheering for the death of its victim, the, that he was crucified at that hour. So the Jews by their tongues, the Romans by their hands, God the Father by his holy will, because of our sins, and then we also, each one of us, by our sins, crucified our Lord. So the whole human race, and the Virgin Mary, most pure, the spotless dove, holding our work, our work, me too. And when she saw the heart of our Lord, when she tried to clean off all the blood and the mess with her tears, uh, she saw the heart of our Lord open, and the Virgin Mary's heart was pierced. She felt that wound. And if you don't believe me, look at St. Philip Neri, whose heart would expand so hot, he bent his ribs, physically bent his ribs. And St. Teresa, Teresa of Avila, you know the, the, the famous stone sculpture of the apparition, St. Teresa of Avila in ecstasy, and there's an angel that struck her heart with the wound of love, and uh, yeah, this is all, you know, the high mystical stuff, but it is, it's real, and her heart, when she died, her heart is still incorrupt, and when they found her heart incorrupt, it was, it had the hole in it, from that arrow, and it's still incorrupt. It was Franco who rescued her heart from the communists, when the communists were moving in, he physically went to the convent and asked for her right arm and her heart as relics. And he rescued them and made sure they would not be damaged. And he took the nuns to safe place. So, so the Virgin Mary, her seven sorrows are not just seven inconveniences. They, were, they really pierced her through. And that's why St. Bernard said she never shed her blood. But she died a martyr. She won the martyr's crown at the foot of the cross. And so, <clears throat> she didn't sleep all, the, all of Good Friday night. How could she? All she heard echoing was the blasphemy, her son breathing, whistling in air on the cross, his seven last words, the meeting on the way of the cross, the scourging. All this just rang in her ears. She couldn't sleep. So Saturday morning, She's out early, walking the whole way of the cross, following some of the traces of blood that the angels gathered. And so, Saturday, she didn't sleep. And Saturday night, maybe, just from exhaustion, fell asleep. Now, during Holy Saturday, the Blessed Mother was often in the cenacle, and the apostles, who ran away like mice, they all gathered at, pretty much gathered at, at uh, Bethany, the house of Lazarus. And slowly the apostles came back to find the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she received them, of course, as a mother. <clears throat> and she receives them, you know, like, like naughty boys who have come back. And, and then uh, there's a knock at the door, and there appears at the door Longinus, the soldier. And he brings to the Blessed Virgin Mary some of the relics of the Passion, one of the, the lances that, that pierced his heart. And that lance would be a relic the Church would treasure and would be lost, and the Crusades would find it in the Middle Ages, and that would revive their spirits for the great battles. And then another strange knock at the door on Holy Saturday would have been um, St. Veronica. 
and the Blessed Virgin Mary, she never lost the faith. She knew the scriptures. She knew the prophecy in Psalm 15, that thou wilt thou will not let thy Holy One to see corruption. She knew the, that all that our Lord spoke of referred to his resurrection. Jonas in the belly of the whale for three days. And Christ would be in the belly of the earth for three days. And Jonas spit out on the beach. Christ would rise glorious. And that, we know, comes right from our Lord. Because that painting is in the catacombs. Jonah and the whale. And the Virgin Mary, of course, she knew. She knew all these prophecies. She never lost the faith. All the apostles lost the faith. So Saturday night, the Virgin Mary, <clears throat> how many, she's been so many hours awake and just crushed, she falls asleep. Early in the morning, early in the morning, Easter Sunday, the three Marys team up together, they rise early, they're going to go finish anointing the body of our Lord. And St. Mary Magdalene, she is a, she's a brave soul. She's fearless. She was fearless at the foot of the cross. She didn't care what those soldiers were yelling at her, mocking her, blaspheming against Christ. She didn't care. She's a, she's a man of a woman, as St. Teresa would say. And St. Mary Magdalene, she's going with the two Marys, Mary of Cleophas and Mary of Salome. And the three Marys are making their way very early to the tomb. At that moment, they, they start discussing, well, how are we going to get through these soldiers? They're guarding the tomb. How are we going to get around them? And St. Mary Magdalene says, don't worry. But the two Marys are a little scared, and they go another, another way. And St. Mary Magdalene, she doesn't care. She's going to find her beloved. She's going to find her the one she'll give her whole life to. And she's, she's fearless. And she goes towards the tomb. At that moment, she can see from a distance the three the, the guards. Some say there were three, some say there were as many as ten, some even say there might have been as many as a hundred guards at the tomb. All of them paid big bucks by the big banks, of, by the big Jews in big Jerusalem. <laughs> and they're paying them good money, so it's not a bad deal, but these, these guards are saying these people are crazy, these Jews are crazy. Isn't it enough that they just killed the man? But the Romans are all shaken up too, because they witnessed the earthquake. They witnessed the, the, the eclipse of the sun for three hours. And this eclipse is recorded by pagan historians in North Africa. Dionysius the Aeropagite writes about it. Flavius, of course, records it. And even in, as far as Spain, they record this. And the earthquake shook all of Europe. St. Francis of Assisi was standing near the mountains where, nearby where he received the stigmata. This was in the Middle Ages, the 1200s. And he asked, he was wondering how these mountains came to be so split and jagged. And God answered his prayer as sending an angel and said to St. Francis, These mountains you see were split on the day of the crucifixion at the earthquake. So that earthquake had to be tremendous. And, and then the Roman soldiers discussing among themselves around the fire in front of the, the sealed tomb, it has the seal of the, the Roman emperor on it, and uh, they're discussing the events of the, the whole time. And what especially, especially sent chills up everybody's spine was watching, seeing through the streets of Jerusalem these dead bodies of prophets who rose through the streets and saying to the Jews, you killed the Messiah, you killed God, 
You crucified the promised one. Daniel foretold and Abraham and Moses. And on that night, the uh, astronomers can go right back to the position of the moon and the stars on that very night. And it is a fact that on that night, the moon rose bloody red. The night of Good Friday. So, all these events they were discussing, and it was just never seen in history, never recorded in history. So, St. Mary Magdalene, she's making her way to the tomb, and suddenly the, there's another tremendous earthquake, and the whole ground starts to shake. And suddenly an immense clap of thunder is sound is heard and the rock of the tomb rolls out and an immense bright light is, is, is poured out of the tomb and this bright light is the the body of our Lord miraculously recovered and the, the shroud of Turin picks up that bright light because the image could not be impressed unless there was a tremendous burst of energy within a few seconds. And this is provable because in the eyes of our Lord they had put coins. This was a very Jewish custom to close the eyelids because if you've ever seen dead people they usually die with their eyes partly open. So out of respect for the dead the Jews put coins in and they have picked up by modern technology in the eyes through the eyelids the metal that had to be triggered by this immense force of energy from our Lord's body, the image of the coins are burnt into the eyelids, into the cloth. And the images show coins that were pounded. They didn't mint them in those days. The slaves would pound them. And the image is that of coins pounded in the time of Pontius Pilate. Coins only made under the time of Pontius Pilate. They can pick up even the shepherd's crook, which was the symbol of Pilate, and some of the lettering as well. And so, that burst of energy that, that branded the face and the whole image of Christ's body into the shroud, which is the treasure we have, a miraculous treasure now. So, these soldiers... The scripture describes that they were so shocked, they fell down as if dead. Velut mortui, says the scripture. They were so shaken. Imagine, well, just put yourself watching a cemetery. Just go to the cemetery, one of you, and just sleep out by the cemetery at night. And imagine just one of these bodies coming out of their tomb. Yeah, that would make you wet your pants. At least... <laughs> These soldiers were no different, and they were scared, they were put to the ground, and it had to be a while for them to just come to their senses, because the, the Holy Ghost doesn't miss any details, and he describes it, they fell velut mortui, they were as if dead, so shocked, so frightened, and the, the stone rolls away, and then everything is silent. The earthquake is calmed down, and the soldiers come to their senses, and they say, hey, Licinius, Marcus, let's get out of here, and they run. They run to the Jews. They find the chief priests, and the chief priests are, these guys are so bitter, and they're so, so, they're like lemons. <clears throat> they're just, they're, they, they're, they're trying to stop every prophecy. And the guards come running and say, look, there was no apostles. We don't know what happened. We can't explain what happened, but he is not there. And we saw this bright light and the rock rolled. These were the first paid witnesses of the resurrection. Paid for by the Jews. And St. Augustine makes a kind of a humor about it, saying that uh, 
the Jews paid them more money and said, look, just don't tell anybody what you saw. Take this money, we're going to pay you more. Here's a ton more money. Just tell nobody what you saw. And so the Jews, that just this shows the synagogue of Satan was really given over to Satan. Because right there they should have converted, if nothing else. So these Romans, I am sure, they all knew Longinus, because Longinus was in charge of the procession from uh, Pilate's Praetorium to Calvary. And the way of the cross, according to one of the mystics, the way of the cross was longer than it should have been. Because the Jews blocked the shortcuts. They were all like, like savage dogs. They would block all the shortcuts through the streets. So our Lord had to go the longer way. And finally Longinus just had to say, cut through these crowds. Cut through these animals. Because the Romans didn't think too highly of the Jews. And the Jews neither. <laughs> so... Longinus and these Romans, I am sure, we know Longinus became Catholic, certainly met the Apostles and the Virgin Mary, he was martyred for the Catholic faith. And there's a huge statue of him that stands not far from the altar in St. Peter's Basilica. He was martyred for the faith. So I, am, I have no doubt that we're, there were other Roman soldiers with him who converted, who saw all this. And we'll know that on the Day of Judgment, some are probably in the Martyrology. And so, St. Mary Magdalene wa watched all this. But she doesn't, nothing connects, and she, she runs to the tomb anyway. The guards are gone, she runs to the tomb. And she sees the, the empty tomb, and now she's just, she doesn't know what's going on. She's just crying. And she sees in the tomb two young men. And these are angels who appear as young men. And she says to them, look, where did they put his body? Tell me where they put his body. I'll take his body. I'll pay you anything for his body. And she's just rambling on and rambling on. And the angels are telling her, trying to talk to her, but she just keeps going. <laughs> Maybe you know, some, of the, some of you have experienced this with, this, with your wives. <laughs> the angels then, their face brightens and they raise their head. And Mary, Mary Magdalene turns around and she sees who she takes to be the gardener, the cemetery caretaker. And so she goes on again with her litany. Please tell me where you made him. I'll take his body. I'll give you any money. I, please tell me where you, where you took his body. And her, it's more of her love speaking than her reason. And then the, 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 our Lord, he says the way he often said to her, Maria, the name of Mary, Maria. And when she, by the, by the power of the Holy Ghost, she was able to see this was really our Lord. And she saw the scars and uh, she it fell to embrace our Lord's feet. Our Lord puts her, his hand on her forehead and he says, Noli me tangere, don't touch me yet because I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go tell the apostles that I have appeared to you and tell them to meet me in Galilee. And so, St. Mary Magdalene, our Lord, vanishes. And St. Mary Magdalene, where our Lord touched her on the skull, her skull is still kept today. And the part, there's, the, there's, a, there's a patch of skin that's incorrupt right here. It's called the Noli Me Tangere. Don't touch me yet. Where our Lord touched her. And of course, her, her sister, St. Martha, and her brother, St. Lazarus, who was risen from the dead by our Lord, the Jews tried to kill them by sending them out on a boat without oars and sails to die out on the sea. And the angels led the boat all the way to southern France, near Marseille. And it's there in that area that St. Lazarus 
converted many people in that area. There was a town called St. Lazare, and St. Martha also founded an order of nuns. And St. Mary Magdalene lived in Baume, B-A-U-M-E. That's, uh, you could go to that cave today, and uh, there she did penance the rest of her life, and she prayed, and she lived as a hermit. So her skull keeps that, Noli Me Tangere. And then she recovers her senses, and she gets up and sprints straight, straight back to the center court. In the meantime, even before St. Mary Magdalene, the Blessed Virgin Mary is peacefully finally sleeping. Her room is filled with a bright light, and tradition holds Christ first appeared to her, of course, his mother, the one that did not lose the faith. And her, her room in the cenacle is filled with light. She hears angels chanting Regina Chaley, and she opens her eyes and she sees her divine son. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, you know, well, how can you explain that? How can we explain that? You can only guess. And I told the women, they can guess better than us men, because they have women in hearts. But our, our Virgin Mother certainly kissed his wounds, kissed her son, embraced him. She was his mother. And our Lord certainly consoled her, because, wow, what woman, what human being suffered more than her? Really. And that's how our Lord treats his own mother. And then look how he treats his friends. You all know that. I'm sure you heard it a hundred times. The famous story of St. Teresa of Avila. She suffered a lot. She was accused of being possessed by the devil. She had hardships found in the Carmelites. She had just hardship after hardship. Trying to re restore the strict order of the Carmelites. She was persecuted by bishops, priests, fellow nuns, and uh, St. John of the Cross himself, who was working with her, was imprisoned. So one day her and her sisters were riding on, a, on a, something like a chariot behind the horses, and as they were passing over a bridge, one of the wheels gave out and threw the sisters and the driver down into the creek below, all muddy and you know, the Spanish creeks and lake rivers are not that deep. So she stood up and she was a hot-tempered Spanish girl and she just shouted, Lord, no wonder you have so few friends seeing how you treat them. And she was mad. But that is how our Lord treats his friends. It is. And you know all that. You all know this. And that's, that's just par for the course. <clears throat> but no one suffered more than the Virgin Mary. Nobody. And that's why she's so powerful with our Lord. Our Lord can't really say no to his mother. And that's why uh, in our time now, uh, we have to be very devoted to Mary, the Virgin Mary. We really have to be men of the Blessed Virgin Mary, men close to her, especially the priests. She is our woman, especially. So, so, words can't go on explaining what cannot be explained, so I'm not even going to try. But there, there you've got the picture. So our Lord then appears to the other Marys. The other Marys are taking the long way around because they're scared of the soldiers and they're going to try to find the, garden, the gardener to open the tomb. But our Lord appears to them also on the way. And they've got the spices and the aloes and uh, there's not much description in the gospel except that they saw him. And they came and ran back to the cenacle with the apostles. So the apostles, like mice, have finally come back to the, to the Virgin Mary. It's her heart that gathers the Pope and the bishops who have lost their faith. And they still don't have the faith. 
because the Virgin Mary is mother and she consoles them. And uh, and she's happy now because she's seen her son. And she's trying to tell them of the prophecies that he would rise. And remember he promised, he, to Peter he told you he would be betrayed. He would be given up to the cross and he would rise the third day. This is the third day. Oh, well, she didn't have much sleep. And then suddenly, St. Mary Magdalene comes in. I've seen him. I've seen him. He's risen from the dead. And then five minutes later, the two women come running in. And the apostles are rolling their eyes, scratching their beards, saying, boy, none of these women have had any sleep. They're all going crazy. And they really didn't believe. They really lost the faith. It's the state of our church now. The Pope has lost the faith. The bishops have lost the faith. Many priests have lost the faith. And many of them are heretics and they don't know it. Because they don't really know the faith. I met a Navasota priest last week in the airport. And he was very interested. And I encouraged him to go, you know, towards the Latin Mass and study. But uh, he had some basic catechism. He believed in transubstantiation. But he also believed in Vatican II. He believed in religious liberty. But he was open to hear. So pray for him, I ask you. But, you know, that's the state of the church. So the Virgin Mary, she's the mother of all the... To, the fallen clergy. The women are rattling away. The apostles don't believe it. St. Peter goes with St. John. we got to check this out. And St. John says, come on, Peter, we must go see. These women, I know them too well. St. Mary Magdalene is not a liar. St. Mary Magdalene, she, uh, she was strong. So St. Peter and St. John make their way to the tomb. And as Bishop Sheen says, this was the first marathon recorded in the Gospels. And St. John being the younger one, of course, he's, he's the first one there. But when he gets there, he doesn't go in the tomb. And it's interesting the Gospels would bring this out because he shows respect for the head of the church. They already, already the apostles see Peter as the chief, the papa, the pope. And St. Peter comes in huffing and puffing. And they, uh, they find, they go into the, the tomb, which was very small, and you had to duck to go in. And St. John, when he, as soon as he sees the shroud, and the shroud is deflated. He was there to wrap the body. St. Peter wasn't. And when the Jews wrapped the body, they wrapped it like a mummy. And the whole cloth, and the shroud, on the shroud, they find wine stains as in a table at a meal. So it is strongly held that it was very likely that the, the cloth that covered the table for the Last Supper was the only thing they had to grab to wrap the body of Christ. And that, that shows up also on the shroud. And so when St. John, as soon as he saw the deflated shroud, it wasn't like when you get out of bed and then you move the sheets. That's not what it looked like. It was completely wrapped up, but deflated. And there's no way a human body could get out. It was completely wrapped up. He was there. He helped wrap the body of Christ. And when he saw the towel over the face folded on the side, and he saw the image deflated, St. John fell to his knees. He recovered the faith. He believed then. Dominus says. It is the Lord. And St. John, because he's pure and closest to the Virgin Mary, he's the first to recover the faith. But St. Peter, he's got all these wild ideas going on. He doesn't, he doesn't believe yet. But they make their way back. And then uh, Emmaus is a town seven miles away from Jerusalem. 
the two disciples, says St. Luke, are walking. These guys are depressed. They're really, they're in the dumps. And they're just walking, talking about all the strange events, the earthquake, the darkness. And then this stranger comes walking up. And it's seven miles long dirt road, so they got a long walk and a long talk. And it's very beautiful to read it, St. Luke. And so the stranger says, you know, what are you, what are you gentlemen talking about? And they say, well, we're, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, we, you haven't heard about him? Well, what about him? Well, he was a great prophet, and you know, he worked many miracles, and he taught in the temple. The chief priests couldn't stand him, but every, the people loved him, and uh, he came on Jerusalem. Weren't you here? Weren't you here for all these events? Haven't you heard about all this? How can you be unaware of what's going on? Everybody knows, the whole town, everybody. There were millions of people in town this past weekend for the Passover, because the Jews would come from all over the world to pray at Jerusalem once a year, and that was it. And our Lord uh, listens to them, and then our Lord starts asking them questions. They don't know it's Him, though. And all on the way, our Lord is exposing to them the whole Old Testament. And for us Catholics, the Old Testament, all History points to Christ. As St. Augustine says, the Old Testament is the shadow, the New Testament is the reality. And it all points to Christ. Not only the prophecies directly, but even the characters involved. It's really neat the way God writes poetry. Because even the characters are prophetic. So, when... Uh, Daniel's lowered in the lion's den for seven days and he rises out of there unharmed our Lord certainly would explain as Daniel Ray was risen from the tomb of where the lions were in their den unharmed so the Son of Man had to be also and he would rise through the passion and death risen And certainly our Lord would have explained to them about Samson. St. Gregory the Great is one of the fathers. Now the fathers of the church, they are the second, third, fourth, fifth generation after the apostles. So you have Christ, the apostles, the age of the apostles, and then you got the fathers, and some of them personally knew the apostles. St. Polycarp knew personally St. John. It was taught by him. And St. Polycarp taught St. Hippolytus. And these fathers of the church were treasured everything they heard from the apostles. That's called tradition. And the authority of the fathers is a, is a tremendous authority. But this is what the Protestants deny. They reject the authority of the fathers. And many of them just don't know it. And when you know Protestants, try to get them to go Read St. Gregory the Great, read St. Augustine, read St. Basil and St. Leo and uh, St. Athanasius. Read these fathers because they treasured everything that they was handed down by word and mouth. And the fathers of the church are our big brothers. We're like the little kids that get on their, their big brother's shoulders to see over the fence of scriptures and the green grass on the other side, the pastures. And the fathers teach us how to read the scriptures. And that's why for us Catholics, we, we should love the fathers. They're, they're such a treasure. And uh, so Samson, St. Gregory the Great says, and perhaps our Lord explained this to the two disciples of Emmaus, and would have told them, remember Samson was captured in Gaza, in the town of Gaza. And today they have discovered Gaza. It's still a town. They know they have the tomb and venerate the tomb of Samson. And they have found, archaeologists have found 
a building that has two huge pillars that were the support of a, of a massive building several stories high that could hold, you know, a couple thousand people. And the ground, the building's leveled now, but they have found this build, this structure. And it's, and it's most likely where Samson was, was. But when he was captured in Gaza, the guards closed the gates of the city. And they watched, because they were going to capture Samson as soon as he came out. And in the middle of the night, early in the morning, Samson came out. And Samson with his long hair, and his, he was huge. And he took the gates of the city, and he ripped them out. Ripped them out right out of the rock and the concrete, broke the bars, and carried the huge iron gates up a, up a little hill and threw them down. And the guards didn't even dare to touch him. And this, says St. Gregory, prefigured Christ, who would be in the tomb, surrounded by guards, and he would break free by the resurrection. And then uh, St. Gregory will say that Samson also, when he was mocked, dressed in white like Christ was by Herod, and made fun of, and when he was in the prison that night of the huge party where they celebrated the capture of Samson, and Samson's eyes had been gouged out, and God gave him strength this night. And he asked the guards, you know, I'm getting a little weary, can you let me rest by the pillars. So they said, sure, yeah. and they tied him up. And St. And Saint Samson grabbed the pillars, and he shook the whole building, and in the, he killed more in that day than in the, his whole, whole many years of battling the Philistines. And so St. Gregory will say that Christ, this prefigured Christ who would take the two pillars who was mocked like Herod by Herod in the white, dressed in the psychiatric ward garment, <clears throat> grabbed the two pillars of the cross, and in his death brought down the kingdom of Satan over souls, and in his death Christ converted more than in the three years of the public life. So says St. Gregory. So, all this way, seven miles, our Lord is talking to them of the resurrection, the prophecies, Moses, and how everything points to Christ's passion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And the disciples, they come to the fork in the road, and uh, our Lord makes as if to continue his journey. And notice how our Lord blesses hospitality. And St. Paul says, come, and our Lord is also in the parable, pursue hospitality. Compel them to come in. And how God blesses uh, those who open their, their doors to those who need. So they pressure our Lord and say, well, look, it's, it's getting dark. Why don't you stay with us tonight? And we'll get you food and you can be off in the morning. So our Lord takes the invitation. And they still don't know it's him. And our Lord goes, meets the family. And when he meets the family, he meets all the children. And he, and, uh, he no doubt blesses them all. And he greets the mothers and the, the old ladies of the house. And all the aunts and the grandmas. And, and uh, the, the disciples are very excited. The, these two disciples, they got a spark of fire in them. Because this... This man has opened their eyes to so much. And now it's time for supper, and they invite our Lord to sit at the head, head table. He's a guest. And they sit down, and uh, he's, he's, he leads to grace. And our Lord reaches out, and he takes the loaf of bread. And the two disciples see the scars. And they're wondering, they're, they're just, their jaws are open. And then they see our Lord do an action that they remembered seeing when he fed the loaf, the, 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 the 4,000 and the 5,000. That was just counting the men, not the women and children, so there were many more. And when our Lord blessed it, 
broke the loaves. That was the same action, and everything came to them. And the scripture says their eyes were open at the breaking of the loaf. And then our Lord vanished. And this is when these two disciples, Cleophas and his friend, they, they recovered the faith. Now, the relatives might have been wondering, you know, what kind of guest did you bring in this house? <laughs> he just vanished. But these two disciples, they said, Mom, Dad, we're going to see you tomorrow. We'll be back. We're, we got to get back to Jerusalem to tell St. Peter and the Apostles. And they run all the way back to Jerusalem. And they say their hearts, were not our hearts burning when we heard him speak? Because all the scriptures was making sense, and it was all centered on Christ. And that's why Jews, you can read the dialogues of St. Justin with Trifo. Trifo was a Jew. Try to get a hold of those dialogues. It's a very short treatise. And St. Justin leads Trifo, a Jew, and shows him how the Lamb and all the Old Testament sacrifices and the Old Testament veil and the vestments of the priest and all the ceremonies pointed to Christ. And he led many Jews to the conversion. So they run back. And finally, during the day, of course, in the uh, afternoon, the apostles in the meantime are all gathered together except St. Thomas. He's out. We're not sure where he was. Was he shopping for food? St. Thomas may have been a, more of a melancholic type. We know that because usually artists and poets are. And St. Luke was an artist. He worked with, uh, see, not Luke, St. Uh, Thomas. He worked, he was a goldsmith. He worked with metal, and he was a painter. And we have in Rome the Salus Populi Romani, it's called. The title of the Virgin Mary, the salvation of the people of Rome. It's a beautiful icon that hangs in St. Mary Majors. And this icon has been carried by St. Gregory the Great himself and many popes down the centuries in processions through Rome, driving out plagues, driving out uh, barbarian invasions, many miracles through this icon painted by St. Luke. So maybe St. Luke was just depressed, out, gone out back to the Garden of, of Olives just to sit under a tree and try to absorb all this. Because, I mean, all the apostles, what they've been through. They lived through the seminary with our Lord for three years. They walked up to 8,500 to 9,000 miles on foot with our Lord. They saw his miracles. They, they, they were deeply attached to Christ. And now that he's dead and he's, they, they've lost the faith, they thought he was the Messiah, like the two disciples said. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was the one promised. And they really lost the faith. They just completely lost it. And these guys were scared because they thought, we're next for capital punishment. So they really are dead scared. So the apostles hiding in the upper room, they're up there, and St. Thomas is off somewhere else. And they're discussing all the events. And suddenly, the room fills with a light. And they all see coming through the wall the very body of our Lord Jesus Christ, passing through the wall. And St. Gregory the Great says, that's how Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. He passed through the womb, like, as he says verbatim, he passed through the womb, the walls of the womb of the Virgin Mary, as he passed through the walls of the cynical. It was a miraculous birth without any pain, totally a, 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 an ecstasy of joy for the Virgin Mary. So, so, when you see the icons, the star on the shoulder, on her crown, and on her other shoulder, that means, in the icon language, that means she's virgin before birth, virgin during birth, virgin after birth. Nothing was broken. Everything intact. 
And so our Lord passed through the walls, and he, the apostles, again, how can we explain? The apostles, according to one of the mystics, they fell to their knees. And our Lord had to gather them like scared little kids who have been, been naughty and scared to get whacked by their father. <laughs> and our Lord calls them, each one, one by one. Come here. This is, touch my, touch my scars. I'm not a ghost. Here, give me something to eat. Peace be to you. And according to one of the mystics, you know, these are grown men, but they have big hearts. And they wept. They wept at our Lord's feet and his knees because they betrayed him. All of them. And Peter the most. And it's St. Polycarp who says, and he would know because he knew St. John, St. Polycarp says that St. Peter had, he wept so often when he heard the rooster crows. He wept so often that he had deep furrows in his cheek, both cheeks. So the apostles, our Lord uh, heals their wounds, their disbelief. They recover the faith, and our Lord vanishes. And, he, and He's already instructing them, because for the next 40 days He will be instructing them. In the meantime, St. Thomas is gone. He comes back that night, and they, they just explode. Thomas, we saw him. He stood right here. We saw his wounds. And, and St. Thomas, he doesn't believe. He's the modern rationalist, the modern scientist. I won't believe until I see it. But St. Gregory the Great praises St. Thomas, saying, St. Thomas' doubts cures our doubts. St. Thomas' disbelief cures our disbelief. Because eight days later, as you know, and we just covered this in the Gospel on Sundays after Easter, Christ comes again. And he immediately calls Thomas, Thomas, come here, touch my scars, put your hand in my side. And don't be unbelieving, but be believing. Blessed are those who don't see and do believe. And St. Thomas does what we should all do every time we see the consecration of the Mass. Dominus meus et Deus meus. My Lord, the human nature, and my God the divine nature. We acknowledge both in the person of the Son of God on the altar and in the Holy Eucharist. So, St. Thomas finally recovers the faith. These apostles after Pentecost, of course, will come out from mice to lions and they will convert the world. Just uh, two last points, a couple last points for your interest and for your study. Uh, as you know, modern Scientists have tried to disprove the shroud as a medieval hoax. And every time they try to disprove it, they, they just come up with more proofs that it really is a miracle. The whole thing about it. They have found pollen on there from flowers that only bloom in the spring, in the month of March and April, in Jerusalem. Only in that area. That pollen is still on there, and they have it. They've studied it, and uh, that's the proof that it was there. They have found the whole image of the suffering of Christ, the scourging from head to foot, naked. And as men, you can imagine the pain of that, because our Lord was suspended like this. And all the... When the Psalm 21, St. David says... They have uh, pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. That has two applications. One, his left shoulder was dislocated, wasn't broken. Numbered his bones, they were so racked. And then secondly, his ribs were exposed. They could number his ribs. He was so violently scourged from head to foot. And so the shroud also shows... Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot, but just to, just to make two points here. I know this is a, it's a small picture, but any copy that you find, you will always find 
on the mouth of our Lord, on his right lip, you will see these letters. <clears throat> Here's his mustache, here's his lip. You're always going to find that on a genuine copy. It's there. It's there. And it's not a mistake. Exodus 3.14. Exodus 3.14. It was for this they killed him. Because, remember in St. John chapter 8, Christ facing these wolves, they surrounded him like a pack of hyenas. And Christ says, before Abraham was made, well, they're, they're mocking him. So you're, you don't even know Abraham. You're not even 30 years old. And you, you've seen Abraham, you fool. And then Christ speaks. Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham was made, ego sum. Ego sum. And and remember, the Jews, they wouldn't even say that name, Yahweh. They wouldn't even say it out of reverence for God. And Christ is saying, He is Yahweh. I am who am. And for the Jews, that was the ultimate blasphemy. But Christ said it truthfully. And they picked up stones to kill Him again at that moment. But Christ didn't lie, and He didn't compromise the truth. And what does that mean? I am who am. Exodus 3.14. These are the words that God spoke to Moses. And the Jews all knew this. And so on the lip of our Lord, on his mouth, on every copy that's genuine, lies those words. <laughs> For every unbelieving Jew to look at. I am who am. And then when you look at his sacred face upside down, I know it's kind of hard for you to see, maybe, but this is also no mistake. This is subliminal messages <laughs> through the shroud, but I don't think they're mistakes. They really aren't. Here you see on his, for his eyebrows, the base. Here you see the stem. Here you see the calyx and the node. And here's the top. The top, the bottom. Stem, calyx, node. Anybody? You see a perfect chalice. Because Christ said, I am with you always until the end of the world, until the consummation of the world. How is he with us physically? How is his sacred heart really here that we actually even drink his precious blood? It's in the Mass. The real Catholic Mass. And so the shroud shows the perfect chalice. And there's so many other incredible things about the shroud. And you see his swollen face, his beat up nose, his chin, his beard ripped out. And yet, through it all, you see his majesty. He is Christ the King. And he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who came born like a lamb, who was, whose first company were simple shepherds. But he would grow up like a lamb among the flock. And as St. Ephraim says, when he finally was slaughtered like a lamb, opening not his mouth before the slaughterers and being killed on the cross, he rose like a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah who conquers, who is victorious. He is the Kyrios, the Lord who is victorious. Kyrios. And... You see the majesty through his face. And you see, follow the whole passion with Pilate, Herod, before the guards, even on the cross. Christ is always in control. He is always at peace. He is always at calm. He is always Christ the King. And they have found bodies of uh, English merchants who, who were sailing into the northern Canadian regions and the lakes. And they found a ship that was the National Geographic. That, you know, it was in, in the 90s. They found this ship that had been caught in ice. And the, the whole crew froze to death. 
and they had buried a number of the crew already. And they unburied some of these bodies, and they find the faces, <laughs> the faces of these poor guys, uh, they're, they're just in pain. The poor guys died in pain. Their lips are all curled, their teeth are chattering, and they really died in pain. <coughs> But one atheist who didn't believe in Christ, he said, I don't know, he said, but after studying the shroud, all I can say is, there's a peace and majesty on this face of a dead man that can't be described. And of course, it's Christ the King, we know that. So let us uh, uh, adore, adore Jesus Christ the King. Fourteen apparitions, and it's all, St. Ignatius has them all in here, they're, they're in the scriptures. Fourteen different apparitions throughout the whole forty days. So, during this, in this meditation, uh, ask a strong faith like the martyrs. Ask the faith of the martyrs and of the faith of the Apostles, who were just fearless. And we live in a faithless age that mocks Christ, that has divorced Him out of everything. And we, we must put Him back, put the crown back on His head. Put the crown back on His head. And Bishop Tissier, in his better days, he did say this. He said, the Church needs an elite of souls whose whole goal will be to put the crown back on. Because Vatican II has ripped it off, and now Bishop Fillet has signed on to ripping it off as well, talking about religious liberty being, being uh, reconcilable with the magisterium. Impossible. So, among you men, give yourselves to work for the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means by study, getting our own heads straight by the traditional papal documents, and the teaching of the Church of all time, and Father Dennis Fahey, all his works, and uh, Hugh Akins has done an, an immense service for the, this apostolate of the kingship of Christ, and you can get a hold of him, and, uh, and then uh, in whatever way God will lead you, in whatever spheres of life that you are in, as fathers of families, businessmen, doctors, lawyers, coaches, teachers, <coughs> whatever, to push, promote, and spread the social kingship of Christ. That is our duty. So let us go to uh, um, Compline is in five minutes. So you can say night prayers on your own in the chapel. If you wish to stay for Compline, Compline will, is the official night prayer of the church. So if you wish to come to that, you're most welcome. Otherwise, I'll give you a blessing now. Benedictus Adeo Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Descendere Subiros, Emanuel Semper Amen.